Hello and welcome to Ask GCN Tech. This week we've got a bike packing special and here to answer your questions, we've got Josh Ibber who is like our bike packing guru. Uh, I think I can safely say that given how much you've done and also the fact that you successfully uh, got me around the Atlas Mountains of Morocco for which I'm very thankful. So yeah, anyway, thanks Josh for popping in. No um, we have got a load of tech questions for you right now. Over on GCN, we've got a load of just general bike packing questions. Uh, we've already put them to Josh, but we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of equipment. Without further ado, big topic seems to be carrying stuff. Well yeah, it's a pretty important part of bike packing. Um, so there's a number of different ways. Um, I mean, we've got a few questions here. We have Emil Starler, panniers versus giant saddlebag. Tom Hood uh, said, why not use panniers if your bike has rack mounts? Uh, he feels that panniers are easier to pack and distribute the load much better. So where do you sit on that particular debate? Well, I, um, I understand both points of view. Each has their kind of benefit. So panniers are the traditional kind of way of, of bike packing or touring or whatever you, you want to call it. It's all essentially the same thing. Yep. Panniers obviously uh, are much more practical for putting loads and loads of things in. However, they do tend to be a little bit heavier, a little bit bulkier, um, and you do need sort of the fixings and fittings on your bike. The benefit of bike packing bags, um, which is kind of like the modern day evolution of panniers, is that they're much lighter and you can put them on pretty much any bike you want. Yeah. Um, you don't need rack mounts, you don't need kind of specific sort of frames on your on your bike on your bike um, so you can use basically whatever bike you have so it makes it a lot more accessible um, if you're thinking of trying bike packing the downside is that they're not quite as easy to pack um, and as you found out during our trip you do need to kind of think about the order um, yep. you pack what you pack and yep. um, you can't just sort of put anything in you need to kind of um, think about the type of stuff you're carrying so quite often lighter more packable items um, are going to be a benefit in a uh, in a bike packing bag um, so yeah, some people tend to prefer panniers for longer distance trips over a number of months. However, I was traveling for six months last year across Europe and America and I was using bikepacking bags. So you can do it, it can be done. Um, and a bit of experience um, and a bit of testing will, will kind of figure out, what, you'll be able to figure out what's best for you. One point I would say about the bikepacking bags is that they do kind of um, suit off-roading more. Um, they do have kind of a bit of natural suspension to them. Yeah. Um, having panniers fixed on like a rigid uh, rack on your bike can can be quite um, awkward off-road sometimes. And if it's particularly rough, um, it, it's just another thing to break. Um, yeah. In terms of like wear on metal and on the racks and the frames, um, a big kind of long distance touring problem um, that seems to kind of often occur on these, these really long trips is, is frames breaking yeah. um, or or pannier um, racks breaking. Yeah. Uh, but obviously bikepacking bags are, are kind of strapped on and they do have a, a natural amount of flex. And if they do break, you can stitch them up again. Yeah, I'm, I must say I was really surprised actually <clears throat> at the kind of, how maneuverable the bike still was, fully yeah. laden with kit. So, so you know, my limited experience involved some, you know, it was basically mountain biking, wasn't it? And actually, yeah. not only was it safe, it was also good fun. Oh was... my God, look at that. Oh, oh wow. wow! Which really took me by surprise. I had an absolute riot, even though I had, you know, an extra whatever six, seven kilos. Cy Richardson kit. I mean, in cycling's fun shocker. <laughs> yeah, basically, no Cyrus in cycling covered in kit. It's shocker, basically. No, I did. I had my preconceptions that you know a bike covered in kit was going to be a little bit pedestrian. Yeah. Well, it's but, different, but you you soon get used to it and you soon yeah. forget about it. And actually, at the end of the day, is is riding a bike. And um, I mean that's one thing you shouldn't overlook. You can't get too kind of absorbed in the whole kind of sort of tech element of it because bikepacking is about exploring and being out there and, and, and riding your bike. And at the end of the day, if you've got panniers or bikepacking bags, that kind of experience is going to be the same. So um, yeah. So just use what works for you. I guess that's one of the key things, like like most stuff in bikepacking. Yeah. Is, is, is as long as it works for you, as long as you're having fun, then then that's kind of important, really. Yeah, totally. Um, <coughs> okay, uh, we've got a question from um, Luigi Di, Pla Di Piazza. Uh, what are the best bags to buy to put all your gear in? I suppose, it, obviously, given what we've just been speaking about, it is very personal, yeah. but, but what should you be looking for when you're looking for, for bike packing bags, leaving panniers to one side for the moment? Well, we've actually got a video that we shot in Rocco that's um, going to be up shortly, we which did. looks into this a little bit more. All right, so. so frame bag. The frame bag is obviously mounted within the frame. The benefit of this is that it's very well uh, secured because it's got lots of mounting points. You can get a half frame pack like this, or you could get a whole frame bag, which will actually take up the whole triangle.
But it depends on, like, like I said, it's very personal. So we're kind of quite lucky because we've got quite big bikes. So that gives you a bit more space to work with. Yeah, that's very true, actually. So we, we could use a frame bag, which is good for carrying bulkier items. Um, and also we had a bit more clearance in the bars uh, over the front wheel for a, a front bag, uh, which is very useful. However, having a big saddle pack, um, as, as Emma uses quite a lot, yeah. is, is useful for putting a lot of volume, voluminous stuff in there. Um, so it, again, it, it's hard to say specific bags for specific people, but it's a case of finding out what works for you. Um, and as I said, we've got a video coming up with some pointers. So I guess the best thing to do is, is kind of try and, uh, yeah. and and go from there, really. We touched on waterproofness, <clears throat> didn't we, when we were out in Morocco. That's that's one thing to look at. Not all bags are waterproof. You get around it, obviously, by packing your stuff inside waterproof bags, inside your bike packing bags, but I guess yeah. that's a big one. And then durability, you probably just find out when you've bought them, how they... Yeah, well, there's, there's a lot of brands out there at the moment, um, and obviously bike packing is a, is a kind of a growing market in terms of the, the cycling um, industry. So there are there's some good brands out there, and generally, durability-wise, they've been tested well. So if you go for a, a good brand name... You were an ambassador for Apadura, right? I use Apadura. Yeah. Um, you were using the, the Topeak bags. Yeah, I had Topeak stuff. And, I mean, I've done a, a six-month tour with the bags, and I still use them now, and actually one of them went on our trip with us. So, yeah. uh, you know, the... the the durability, um, generally it's well tested. Yeah. Obviously if you crash or something, then you can damage them. Um, but it's, it's kind of one of those things and it just goes with the territory really. Yeah. All right, there you go. Hopefully uh, that's uh, helped out on the on the bag side of things. Um, we are now, uh, this question makes me smile, Josh. Uh, Sam Leach, for those of us coming into winter, it's not often we get one over the Southern Hemisphere crew, but here we go. We actually saw blue sky yesterday, We've got t-shirts on and everything. Yeah, yeah, totally. We were a bit cold, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Sam said, for those of us coming into winter, what are your tips on staying warm on the bike and through the night? So I guess, I guess winter bike packing is a whole different ball game, right? Yeah, well, there's um, there, there's there's kind of proper winter stuff. There's there's obviously races and, and rides in Alaska and places like that. That's a whole different level to kind of yeah. what we did. I mean, we were quite lucky we didn't get that cold. But my tip would be it's all about layers. Um, so start with a good solid base layer, maybe have a few options. And then you want your jersey, arm warmers, and then just sort of varying thicknesses of, of outer garments. So we had um, gelets and then we had waterproof tops. You might want to add like a, a windproof long sleeve in there. Um, we had down jackets for the evening. Um, so that's obviously, that's probably a key thing for bikepacking is, yeah. is having a down layer. Even if you think you won't need it. I mean, we were in Morocco and most of the time it was getting on for 30 degrees C. Yeah. However, we were very, very glad to have those warm jackets in the evening. Yeah, um, and a bubble hat. And too. a bubble hat, yeah. So things like that, they, they don't, they don't weigh very much, um, so it's always worth having a few extras in there to keep warm. Um, yeah, I, can I say I was <clears> absolutely <throat> paranoid about getting cold, uh, so I also took overshoes with me, uh, a nice thin pair of overshoes, so I didn't want to have cold feet. Uh, I took a uh, thin pair of full finger gloves because I didn't want to get cold hands, uh, and actually, ironically enough, I got too hot, uh, so there we go. But um, but yeah, I think you know you, you can, I guess, just pack that stuff, as long as you're willing to carry it, yeah, that's then that's the fine. I mean, again, like the, the thing we keep, keep coming back to is it's a personal thing. So if you know you get cold hands, then pack extra gloves. Um, because at the end of the day, you're going to be out there by yourself. You, you may be remote, you might be near civilization, but it, you need to be com comfortable because if you get cold, you get uncomfortable, then then it will make it an unenjoyable experience. Yeah, almost as bad as getting hungry. I, my my <laughs> thing, worse. yeah, my thing was that I'm probably a stronger cyclist than I am like a general kind of tough survival kind of expert. So I figured I'd rather have slightly heavier bags and stay warmer when I, at night than you know go minimalist and go faster. And actually it did work out because uh, I did manage to lug everything up and uh, yeah, it worked out. What about bivy bags? So um, so when you're sleeping out, uh, we didn't take tents, we just had uh, what are called bivy bags, so like waterproof sleeping bag covers basically. Uh, Chris W. Saul, what bivy bag models are the ones to go for when bike packing? Well, again, there's lots, loads of different brands out there. We were lucky to have a bit of help from Rab, um, yep. and that's a brand that I've used for a while. Uh, so we had, um, what was the model? I think it was the Storm Bivy. Storm Bivy, yeah, it was a yep. zip bivy bag. Um, again, we could almost do a whole tech show on different types of bivy bag. Um, there's there's kind of open face models, there's ones with zips like we had, so you can get some with insect necks, you can get some with little tent poles in. But yeah, it was a waterproof one, wasn't it? Super light. Yep. Um, it's got to be quite tough, because at the end of the day, that's 
that's what you sleep on. Uh, and then inside the bivy bag, we had our mats and yeah. then our sleeping bags on top of that, didn't we? Yeah, so the, the, we chose those bags because we knew we were going to be sleeping up quite high. Um, in the end, it worked out pretty good. However, yeah. we did have a moment when we were riding over the mountains and we could see a massive thunderstorm above us. And there was a moment of, uh, are we going to get really wet here? Can we get down the mountain before it, the storm comes in or will the storm just go away? Yeah. And, um, but we were prepared. We, we Again, it's like it's, you need to plan in advance. We, well, I decided that we should probably take zips. Yeah, I needed some convincing because <laughs> I thought a tent would be better. But anyway, but, actually uh, it, it worked out. out. Yeah. It did work out. Um, so there we go. Uh, Bivy bags, waterproof and uh, probably a zip one and a hoop if you get claustrophobic. Uh, right, uh, Johan Mahler, uh, his question, uh, similar to many others actually, how do you deal with charging electrical items such as your mobile phone, your GPS units, uh, we had Wahoo Elements on there, and also lights as well. Do you have a lot of batteries? Alvin Martin, uh, how are you charging your lights and the Wahoo on the go, with a battery pack or using a Dynamo hub? Well, there's a number of options for that. So uh, you were using a battery pack? Yeah. Um, and I had a, a Dynamo Hub for, for charging my stuff. So you can go either way. If you're going for a... For, you, we, to be honest, we probably didn't need Dynamo Hubs for what we were doing because we stayed a couple of nights in hotels which allowed us to top up and then you, you were topping up your um, your battery pack. Yeah. I went for the Dynamo option. Um, so the benefit of a Dynamo obviously is that you don't need to recharge. You've got endless energy uh, as long as you're pedaling yeah um, so so when we were sort of up in the mountains at night there, there wasn't an issue about running out of light um, and also I have a, a little inverter on my bike um, so it's a uh, I think it's a sine wave reactor was is the model uh, it's basically like a, a USB converter okay so essentially it's a endless supply of power as long as you're pedaling so from that I then can charge the Wahoo um, my phone. You said, I think, I seem to remember at the time that you, it's better to charge a battery pack because if you charge a mobile phone directly from a yes. Dynamo, then the current's not quite right or something. Yeah, it's, it's not so much the current, it's more that the um, the fluctuations. Um, so if you're if you're riding at a really constant speed, then it's kind of all right. However, if you're stopping and starting, especially riding off-road, um, some, of some of the circuitry in, in gadgets can be quite sensitive. Um, so it's often safer to just charge a battery pack um, and then use that to charge your, your phone. Um, also, it means that you can charge a battery during the day and then at night when you need your lights, you can just swap over. You can't really run both at the same time okay. because it, there's only so, mu so much power um, and you kind of, it, it kind of doesn't, you don't get full power to both no. um, the charge and the light if you're using both at the same time. So it's best practice to try and use the two separately. Yeah, I, uh, I actually managed to get Josh's pristine white battery pack covered in chocolate. Is it recovered? Or? <laughs> I haven't tried it yet. Oh yeah, sorry mate. It looks really bad. Anyway, there we go. So uh, yeah, Dynamo. We actually got a video coming up on the tech channel specifically about Dynamo hubs. Uh, so Josh was using Hunt wheels in that video and uh, so we've got a video explaining all about how they work. Uh, I'm going to have to do some swatting up on my uh, physics clearly. Uh, right then, moving on. Now this is quite a hot topic, okay, <clears throat> uh, about durability and also availability of spare parts when you're out about. So, uh, Mattim, have you ever broken any bikes uh, or frames whilst you're bikepacking, Josh? Are frame bags running against carbon an issue? So let's deal with that one in isolation first, sorry. The, yeah, so frame packs, one of the disadvantages is they can rub. Um, so one thing we did before we set off is we put protective frame tape um, on the tubes. So it's not really necessarily going to um, sort of damage the, the carbon um, in terms of the structure however it can scuff paint and you know if you spent a lot of money on a carbon frame you don't want to scuff it up yeah so i'd always recommend using a protective frame tape a helicopter tape for one of another, another word yeah um and both of us did that beforehand um so yeah it, it, it can cause some issues but if you prepare for it it'll be fine yeah okay and what about the durability side of things then um you know if you're out for like months on end then i guess your bike goes through quite a bit of yeah. A bit of punishment. Yeah, so um, the main thing that I found, obviously, the, the, the number one thing is, is tyres, which I think we're probably going to cover in a little further down the line. Are. number of questions about that. Um, I found that chains were, you go through chains and drive chains quite yeah. quite often. So it's, it's good to think ahead. Um, so I was touring a lot in Europe and North America. Obviously, you can get parts relatively easily. If I was, um, say, in South America or somewhere, somewhere more remote or Central Asia where you just can't get parts, then I would carry some with me. So I'd probably carry an extra chain, definitely spokes for wheels. Um, 
potentially a tire, but we'll cover that shortly. Um, obviously cables, brake pads, all of that stuff you want to have. It doesn't take up too much room, No, but it's worth um, planning to take that with you. Yeah. Um, okay, now uh, Sticker Rides on Twitter said, uh, what are the chances of carbon failing when you're in the wild? Uh, Specifically to you, have you ever considered a more robust frame material? Now, you're an ambassador for Mason bikes, so you I actually am, ride yeah. aluminium bikes I normally, do. don't you, yeah. today? I, I've ridden alloy for the last sort of, three or four years, actually. Um, and I think a lot of people say, oh, sort of, aluminium's heavier or more old-fashioned, but I tend to disagree now, because um, aluminium frames from when what we first started racing sort of 10, 15 years ago compared to modern ones are very, very different in terms yeah, of technology. True. Um, and actually, I've ridden modern aluminium frames, and they're comparable to carbon. Um, yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions <coughs> about frame materials generally. Yeah. We've tackled this uh, in the past in various different videos. But the, the, uh, the idea that carbon is fragile, the only reason it's got a reputation is because carbon is used at the kind of pinnacle of frame design to make stuff as light and as aerodynamic as possible. And if you're ever going to make a super lightweight bike out of any material, whether it be steel or aluminium or titanium or carbon, you're gonna cut corners on durability. You can't have light and super durable at the same time. So you, you only have to look at mountain bikes where they've adopted carbon, you know, wholesale, haven't they really? Downhill mountain mm. bikers racing on carbon wheels and with carbon frame sets. So it, it can be super, super durable. It just depends on yeah. whether or not uh, the particular manufacturer has actually designed that frame to be durable or whether they've prioritized something else instead, like yeah. lightweight, basically. Yeah, exactly. And, and when you look at other applications, uh, engineering, like Formula One, for example, yeah, the carbon fiber is used to protect drivers, so you can be made to be really impact resistant. So, yeah, going back to the original question, I've never personally had a um, an issue with carbon items on any of my trips. Um, and obviously, I, I do normally ride a, an aluminium mason bike. Um, and again, I've had no issues with that. However, things do happen. I mean. I think any bike is is subject to some kind of potential damage. You know, I could get a big rock through the, the bottom of the frame. It could dent an, an aluminium frame. Yeah. Or crack a carbon frame. Yeah. I think the thing you got to say about carbon, and I'm not advocating carbon as the material of choice. <clears throat> more just trying to set the record straight. Is you can fix it actually, mm. and you know, it's it's. Well, you can't repair aluminium frames. I think you can't reweld them, can you? Not very easily, no. No, and a lot, and some modern steel alloys as well. You can't do the same either. So, so that is something to bear in mind. I mean, it depends what kind of country you're riding and whether or not you. Can and quite, get quite often, like the repair. traditional touring bikes have been made of steel, and it's not because steel won't fail; it's because it can be repaired. So, yeah. maybe that's something to, to consider if you're going for a longer tour. However, we're on a, a, a kind of a short tour, so you know, it's it's kind of worth the punt really for yeah. a week long tour. You, the, the, the chances of of having a like a, a fatigue kind of um, failure, a, a slimmer. I mean, if we were going to have a, a problem, it would have been because a big rock smashed through it. Yeah. Or we crashed or something kind of like that. And, yeah. And I, the, I guess the other thing as well is when you take your bike <coughs> packing bags off is what you want to do with the bike. Because, yeah. you know, you could have a hardcore steel touring bike, but it might not be, you know, as fun to ride as a road bike when it's not got your panties on it. Whereas you could have you know, a carbon road bike, stick some bike packing bags on, and away you go. Yeah, exactly. you know, that's that's one bike that does all of it. Um, so anyway, loads of things to think about. This is the theme that we keep coming back to. Bike packing is personal, with personal choices. <laughs> yes. um, but uh, Tobias Voss, uh, I've got a slight problem with 3T cranks for bike packing. So those are our uh, very spangly, mm. brand new 3T Torno cranks. Uh, he's imagining being somewhere uh, away from a big city um, and then having a problem with them. How do you find a replacement chain ring? Um, is it a problem? Um, you know, it could be a problem even in a, a city in Western Europe, which is yeah. a good point. It is a good point. Um, however, it kind of goes back to the last point. I mean, for a really long tour, you probably wouldn't use um, quite as a, a specialist chain set as that because, like say, spare parts are harder to come by. Having said that, had we had a like a, a more of a standard chain set for, for example, maybe like a the, the matching SRAM Force chain set to match the rest of the group set, we probably wouldn't have found any parts anyway. Um, where we were outside of Marrakesh, there wasn't really any bike shops, and I think the bike shops in Marrakesh probably wouldn't have had those those no. parts as it was. So. Again, if you're going to take some spares, and maybe it might be worth taking chainring bolts and, and things like that, but I mean, if you do have an issue with something like that, then you, you, you kind of almost have to get yourself out of it. Yeah, I guess, I guess you take the risk, don't you? But then you take the risk, you know, if you set out for a big day ride, in that, you know, you have mm -hmm. to cut corners with the kind of repair kit that you've got with you. If something fundamental does happen, that's 
game over, isn't it? You yeah. know, you need to find a way home. You've got quite a cool story about bodging disc brakes, right, in Southeast <laughs> yes. Asia? Yeah, so I, I did a tour around um, Vietnam, Laos and, and Thailand, and uh, I arrived in, in uh, Hanoi in northern Vietnam, and um, the probably my fault, I'm sure there's some maintenance issues along the line, but the, um, the, the stopper in my brake lever, uh, this was a, a mountain bike lever, um, had come out and all the hydraulic fluid had come out my, my bike uh, at the front brake and I was pretty worried because obviously like we've discussed parts aren't that re readily, readily available for, for that kind of level of equipment but I went to a motorbike shop in, uh, in Hanoi and, um, and I got my brake fixed it took about five guys and the whole thing was stripped apart it definitely wasn't a GCN uh, maintenance video level of uh, well it could have been <laughs> on hack or bodge Josh let's put it that way it was definitely Definitely a bodge, but it definitely worked. And um, to this day, I still have the, uh, the Phillips screw and washer blocking the, um, the, the cap on my brake. Yeah. And I've not, I've not bled it since, and this was three years ago. There you it go. still works fine, so there we go. It's amazing what a bit of ingenuity and a bit of engineering knowledge can do to actually yeah. get you out of a sticky situation. And quite often, um, the countries such as Morocco, where we were, I mean, the people are isolated all the time anyway. They don't just have like a garage to mend their moped or, or their bike or their car or their truck. They have to be resourceful and, and mend it themselves. And I think in, in our Western kind of world, we, we are reliant on services to mend stuff like that. But out there, it's people make do and they have to fix stuff. So actually, there's normally a way somehow of or fixing something or at least getting out of trouble if you're in a place like that. So um, it's, it's part of the, the adventure, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I guess it is actually. Uh, right, we've got uh, a series of questions from Espace Vectoriel. Uh, this summer I will cross France from east to west for my holiday. I've got so many questions as these three weeks will be my first experience of bike packing. Road saddle or special saddle? This is like a quick fire round. Okay. Uh, Work, whatever works for you. Quick fire, quick fire. Uh, yeah, so but we used road saddles, didn't we? I was we just did. on a physique area yeah. only. But we were both comfortable. You changed the saddle because you were comfortable on that. And yep. I used the saddle I was comfortable with. So the saddle is a key, key element. So you use the saddle you're comfortable with and have tested beforehand. And also some shorts that you've tested beforehand and you're comfortable with and, and you'll be all right. Yeah, clipless pedals or flat pedals? I guess it's personal. Um, I've been riding clipless for years and years and years, and I feel kind of if I, if I ride a bike without clipless, I feel like driving a car without seatbelt almost. Yeah. It's that kind of level. So again, I prefer I prefer um, clipless. Um, if I was going for a tour like that, I'd have a more relaxed pair of shoes. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't wear, wouldn't use sort of road shoes. Um, no, we have mountain bike shoes. Yeah. Mountain bike pedals. Didn't just we? makes life easier just to walk around. Um, but again, it is really, really kind of up to you um, and a very personal thing. So. So yeah, I'm avoiding that answer as well. <laughs> okay, uh, navigation by GPS or by map? Um, again, we used navigation by GPS. Um, we did a lot of planning beforehand and had a GPX. Um, however, we did have to kind of go off route a little bit and freestyle. If you've got a, a map, you've, you've always got some kind of way of navigating. However, I mean, we found that the roads kind of didn't correspond to necessarily what we planned anyway. So no. it's just assuming your map's correct in, in those kind of places. Yeah, sometimes, I guess in France, you'd be, you know, maps maps are great, whereas yeah. actually things are being developed so fast mm. that actually, you know, a brand it's, new tarmac road just appeared. Especially in places, for example, I've heard stories of, of uh, maps in China and then there's a whole new motorway and a whole new city that's not even on, on a map. So, no way. I mean, it, it depends on the, the how up to date your maps are, how they're developing. But generally, I mean, we found when you're on a bike, you, you kind of have a good sense of roughly where you're going. I mean, we we probably could have got away with it if, if our GPS had failed. Yeah. Basically, we rode up and over the mountains, along the back, and up and over again. So we, we could have figured it out sort of geographically. And I think that's a nice thing about bikepacking. You do get a good kind of feel of of the terrain and, and, and your general direction. So Yeah, the good thing about GPS, you've got to say, <laughs> was that we were navigating at night very yeah. briefly, and uh, that would have been a bit more of a yeah. We, we, obviously, you can navigate with a map and a compass by night, um, but it was nice and easy, wasn't it? Let's put it that way. Didn't Definitely, it? Didn't yeah. It? It's, it's, it's good and convenient for a short trip. However, for a longer trip, um, you know, I've, I've planned for my, my longer trip across the States and stuff, and then I changed my plans and didn't use GPS at all, just used road signs and, and maps and it's old uh, school and general knowledge. So, again, I guess it's personal. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, uh, Mikey Sin, uh, actually, it's a question to me. Ah, amazing. Uh, what size tyres was I running? They look beefy. They were. They were actually Continental 650B mountain bike tyres. So they were 2.2 inches wide, which measures up as about 55. They were absolutely the biggest thing I could squeeze into that bike. But I was very glad of them. They rolled pretty well yeah, and they were a lot of fun. The <laughs> yeah, they were, they were pretty fast on that downhill. So that was cool. Um, but there was some controversy uh, about tyre choice. Yeah. So uh, a lot of 
of people who I suspect um, are experienced bike packers or cycle tourers. Um, John the Doors, running tubeless on a touring setup seems like a silly idea to me. Uh, Chris, ha, tubeless on a bike packing touring bike, hell to the no. Uh, to which low hanging fruit replied, 650B to boot, ruin the tire on your strand unless you bring your own spare. So, from experienced cycle tourers to experienced cycle tourer, tubeless. Tubeless is a no brainer for me. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've used it for years and years, mountain biking. Um, I use it on the road. I just think it's a better system. Um, yes, there could be some issues repairing, but at the end of the day, if you cut a, a clinch tire with an inner tube, you've still got a tire with a hole in it and a tube with a hole in it. Yep. So you've still got to repair it in the same way. There are some some kind of quick fixes for tubeless, like the tubeless plug kits and things like that. Yeah. Um, however, if you do have a, a bigger mechanical, you might have to put a tube in it or stitch your tire or um, you know, use a tire boot, but you'd have to use that on a on a kind of clinched tire anyway. So for me, you're, you're essentially that the, there's no downside to having tubeless. Um, you'd, you'd have to carry the same spares that you, you might have to with a, a clincher setup, but um, you might as well just have the benefits of tubeless and, and carry the same spares. Yeah, that, that's my view um, on, on that one. Yeah, I think that's right. I guess the only time tubeless traditionally has been difficult for road cyclists is when uh, the rim and the tire. Uh, well, the rim is is, a, is at the larger end of the diameter spectrum, and the tire is at the smaller end, which makes it super safe and secure. But you can get stuck by the side of the road, literally unable yeah. to get your tire off. But that doesn't happen so much anymore, I guess. No, no. And the thing is, as well, just if you know that's the case, then don't use those tires for that trip. You've got to use what is comfortable for you. Um, again, it's the same theme. You've got to use what works for you. So for me, cheapest tires works, and I know I can change them. I know I can repair them and I know I can get myself out of trouble if I need to. However, if you're not so confident, then uh, you maybe stick to what you know. Yes. Yeah. For the record, I had inner tubes in, actually, for yeah. that one. Uh, so, uh, so there you go. And one thing I did find uh, was that I struggled to find uh, long valve inner tubes for 650B wheels. So uh, I invested in some nice new valve extenders, brass ones, very old school. So uh, anyway, there we go. From new school to old school in one fell swoop. Uh, right, Josh. Thank you very much, mate, for no uh, for all your time. Um, do keep those questions coming in because I'm sure, uh, well, we've got more bikepacking content coming up on GCN, as Josh said. So a load of how-to videos uh, that we shot when we were over in Morocco. And if you've got any more questions for Josh, then keep them coming in. We'll save them up. And uh, if you don't mind, Josh, I'm sure we'll get you back in at some other point. Yeah, it's too, quite a nice ride over. So I That's right. And you, next had, time. you had a nice ditch to sleep in last night as well. I did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was great. It wasn't too wet. Uh, not by British standards, anyway. So uh, anyway, yeah, thanks very much. And if you want to see the Ask GC Anything with Josh, then uh, there's a link to it on screen now as well.